Okay, well, thank you all for joining me today. And um, what we're going to do is, is, I actually was just talking with Jessica earlier, is at the end of the session, I'm going to provide uh, a handout that, sh that you can use to kind of augment our material. I don't really like doing it simultaneously because I feel like it's harder to stay in the moment. So we're going to kind of go through this experience all together. So, um, you know, what, the reason I'm giving this lecture is that I, when I was first starting teaching, uh, and I'm sure all of us have had this experience, is, and, and as a learner, as a student as well, um, I just I just did what I was taught. I I went through, and, and a lot of that, of course, it works. Um, it's, there's not that's not a bad thing. But I didn't really consider uh, how people learn. I mean, actually, just going beyond clarinet, but just how our body systems work and and how we learn. And uh, I really became interested in that uh, over time because I feel you know that's such an important component um, to just understand just basic learning techniques. Uh, I will say that if we had more than 30 minutes, and if we have time at the end, I promise I will do this. Um, I usually do this uh, lecture and teach you how to juggle at the same time. Uh, if I have a chance, I will do that actually at the end, but it, it probably takes more time than we have today. I have not juggled uh, online, um, but I'm happy to try that with all of you if we have time. Um, so. The first thing is when we're talking about perceptual motor learning, what that means. Um, so for perception, uh, that is using your sensory information, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. Um, and, and then motor, of course, is muscle. And one of the things that we do know is that, that we learn our best as we did as children. Uh, and so one of those things that, that, that you can see like with the Suzuki method, this is um, a concept that's taken from Daniel Kohut and then also, uh, you know, you've got several, several other um, pedagogues who've used this over time, um, is that it's a, a kind of our natural learning process. Uh, and so what I would say is that that to, to try to stay with me, and I'll try to repeat these things, but you can write them down because you know as we go. Um, but essentially, it has a couple of components. Um, the first component of the natural learning process is mental imagery, and so you obtain mental imagery by having sensory information come in, and then you have this you, this vision or kind of imagination. Um, the second part of it. Is imitation. So you're you're going past that. You know you have your mental image, and then you you have imitation. The third one is trial and error practice, um, and the fourth one is body feedback. Okay, and, and the body feedback part is back where you're getting you know your sensory information is engaged to determine whether or not you've achieved the mental image that you set forth at the very beginning. Um, so this is you know if you want to think about when you were a baby. Uh, this is how we all learned, you know, to walk and, and talk. I mean, all of our, you know, starting out those learning processes. Um, that hasn't, I mean, by the way, for perceptual motor learning, um, whether you're a baby, we just did it really well at that time. Um, that hasn't changed in the way that we learn information. If you want to know that, um, juggling would actually be one of the ways that we could show you. But the other is just thinking about, well, when you're, riding a bike and I mean whether or not you learn to ride a bike at a very young age or you learn it uh, at 50 uh, you go through the same process and learning to ride a bike is very different than actually uh, you know solving a math problem for instance um, we, we go through a different way of learning for that um, so one of the interesting things is that as as we you know go on um, we kind of we we make that natural learning process a little harder to access for ourselves. Um, and so we're going to talk about first some of those reasons why, and then I'm going to skip ahead um, to some of these things that are more detail-oriented about the brain and the nervous system, and um, and then we're going to come back about at the end about how to get this process back. But let's talk about how we lost it. Um, so one of the reasons that we um, lose this process is that we end up concentrating a lot um, on the process of learning something um, versus the goal. That's one. Of, so that's number one. Number two. Um, in this one is that we get in, absorbed with verbal descriptions of techniques um, about how to learn something. 
Um, and number three, we all know this really well, is anxiety resulting from competition. Um, so for instance, uh, when you were a baby, uh, learning how to walk. I always use, um, I'm going to just, I see, I see Denise is here. So I'm going to use, if Denise and I were ch babies um, living next door to each other, um, which would have been great actually, but um, if we were babies and, and so I'm going through my process of learning how to walk. Um, and that would be, you know, that I, I'm sitting in my crib and I'm, I'm basically just watching, um, I'm watching what's happening and at my own pace, um, you know, when I'm ready, I, I will start doing the, you know, trying things out. So I'm going to go through the imitation, you know, I observe, um, I'm going to go through the trial and error part of this practice. Um, and then body feedback is of course, if I fall, thankfully I'm very close to the ground. So it's not such a scary thing. Um, you know, that's giving me body feedback and I'm doing this along the way. Um, one thing that's not happening now, my parents, um, uh, are giving hopefully, but my parents did, but, um, hopefully a lot of really positive encouragement. Um, you know, if I do something just a little bit better then I get a, an enthusiastic hurrah for that, um, which is fabulous. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, understand anything um, except for really expressions uh, so I have none of those things and I'm not worried like I'm not worried about the fact that maybe Denise started walking a, a week before me um, so I'm not thinking wow like I'm really slow I'm behind I you know I, I yeah I should be ahead of where I am I have none of those things and so I'm basically allowing that learning process to take pace uh, you know at, or take place at the pace uh, that I need it to be um, and so it's kind of this really beautiful, magical time for us as learners. Um, we are truly doing something um, that is something that really works for us authentically. Um, and so it's it's kind of this preserved moment. Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna talk about now. We're gonna move ahead to some of what those details are, how this really functions, and then we're gonna come back about how to get this back. Um, Okay, so if we look at what that natural learning process is, um, we have about 11 uh, systems, you know, in our body. The ones that we're going to talk about today are the, the muscular system and the nervous system. Um, the muscular system is comprised of three different types of muscles. So you have smooth, cardiac, and skeletal. Um, you really don't need to know all of that, but the, we're really looking at really um, skeletal muscles. The cardiac, of course, is your heart. The smooth muscles are inside your organs, um, but the skeletal muscles are what we're talking about. So um, past that, um, then we look at the nervous system. And this is one of those things that actually, I mean, this is something that changed a lot for me when I was thinking about um, how I'm teaching and just this, the role of the nervous system because, because this is it. For us, this is how all of our sensory information is going to be accessed. Um, so there are two major things I want you to think about with this. And again, you'll get notes about this later, but we can try to hang on to this. So the central nervous system, so that's central to everything, um, that's comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. So you can see that like right in the middle. Um, and then we have the peripheral nervous system. And if you want to think about this as kind of periphery, like around the central nervous system, okay? Um, that is broken down into two different parts. One is the sensory somatic, okay? And the other is the autonomic. Sensory somatic is, is everything that's on the external, in, in our external world. So we, we, everything that's kind of like sight, sound, everything that comes from ex externally outside of our body is in the sensory somatic part of the peripheral nervous system. Everything that's internal uh, is part of the autonomic nervous system. And so you may want to ask, like, well, what would those senses be? That's like hunger, you know, so something like that um, is, is something that's on the inside. Um, the autonomic nervous system has broken down into two further parts. And it's a little more complicated than this, but it's just an easy way of thinking about it. Um, so when you think about that autonomic system, uh, you have the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And parasympathetic is, uh, you probably have heard of some of these things before. The sympathetic is, is the kind of fight, this is the fight or flight, 
um, response that we have. The sympathetic is, is kind of getting revved up for a fight, and the para or stop like is is to kind of get us back down. Okay, so that is a very cursory overview of things. And so what's happening is at, like at this moment for all of you, um, you your your peripheral nervous system is taking in all of this information, so it's sending sensory neurons in. Um, to the central nervous system. Okay, so then we're going to talk about with this, like with the three stages of, of brain function, because this is kind of how this all works. All that information is coming in. Um, so sensory neurons are coming in. And then we have what we call information processing. And that's where your brain is taking that information um, and filtering out unnecessary information. And we're going to talk about why that's really important. Um, the next stage is the decision executive stage. It's going to be that process of deciding, well, what to do then with that information. And then motor output is then you have the motor neurons going out. Okay, so then, then your muscles are going to react to what those information systems are. Um, so what does that look like? You know, when you think about kind of from a learning process or kind of when we're just functioning in the world, um, I always go back to... <laughs> Um, student driving um, and kind of why all of us really want to stay far away from student drivers even though we have memories of that ourselves. I have a really um, good story actually about, well I'll tell you this because I mean it's just when I was um, in, when I was in driver's ed um, I my dad was a, a golfer and so we you know I, I drove golf carts from an unknown age um, the person I was paired with had never driven a car before and um, was really clearly very nervous. So what, what you have is when you have all of this information coming in, so, you know, we were we were driving in a, in a neighborhood and the driver's ed instructor said, you know, turn on your signal. It was a right-hand turn, so turn on your right-hand turn signal. So she did. Um, and and then hit the brake and then you know take the turn and so she she got confused so all this information is coming in she confused the gas with the brake um, and so we went squealing around at this corner um, where a jogger was in the road um, and there was nothing the driver's ed instructor really could do without us flipping the car over so but amazingly um, the drive the jogger actually jumped up almost like a cat kind of back. Um, onto this bank. I've never seen anything like it before or since. Um, well, his system was working really well. Um, but what it was showing is that, you know, when you have the, when you're just learning how to drive, all this information is coming in. Um, and you're, you know, you're not, you're that, it's, you don't know enough to be able to decide what is important information for you to listen to. Um, and so then, therefore, you're going to get these, these confused signals in your motor output. Um, so it's kind of one of those things when you're kind of thinking about it that way. Um, so, you know, when you think about what that means for us sometimes in music would be the same thing of, um, you, when you actually are, are in a situation where you have all that information coming in and then you add into this this kind of fight or flight response you're, you've got all the sensory information coming in from both your um, external systems and your internal systems and then your motor output is often not what you want it to be um, and so we'll talk about what that means a little bit more in, in just a moment so um, Going beyond that, and I'm not going to go, I mean, into some of this other detail as far as, you know, brain structure, um, but what I do want to talk about a little bit is kind of just if you're thinking of kind of upper and lower brain um, function. And I think, you know, uh, Timothy Galway would use some, you know, say, refer to this as kind of self one and self two. Um, self one is that voice that we were talking about that was, you know, the two babies. Um, that's that's judging um that's that's also kind of trying to control that process all the time that's talking about how things should be done um and self two is kind of what we would associate with our lower brain which would be just something that is just would be like okay um you know that uh, like a reflex 
Um, and so we have a lot of reflexes. Uh, reflexes would be something like, you know, if somebody taps your knee and your, you, your leg automatically goes up. Um, so that's something that we, we know works. Um, so what I think we're most interested in, because of course those reflexes, that's great that they're there. Um, but we, I mean, as musicians and as performers, what we're actively looking for all the time is to get, get you know, ourselves into a place where we're, we're dealing with condition reflexes, which are, means that you basically um, have, have worked on um, your, the way you're learning something so that it is so ingrained um, that it becomes like a conditioned reflex. And so what does that look like? That looks like um, when you cross the street, you have learned to look left. Um, if you grew up in the United States, uh, and then your first days that you go to visit London, and they even put on the sidewalk, you know, um, to look right. Um, and it's dangerous because you look left first, and you start crossing the street, and then like a moped will come, and uh, you have a scary moment. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, that feels really rather ingrained for us. Um, so... Uh, what we're, you know, that's just, that's what our ultimate goal is that we're kind of looking to do. Um, so the, the other, the last thing I want to actually talk about as far as just getting into, um, you know, our sensory systems, and then we're going to kind of work on actually how to use this information, um, would be our kinesthetic, um, senses and also the vestibular mechanism. Vestibular mechanism is essentially uh, balance. So that's in your inner ear. You know, the, the reason that matters for us so much in, um, in our learning in this case is that if you, you know, and, and I so wish that posture, as we all do, um, that our posture was a reflex. If it was actually a reflex, then we would be, you know, all with perfect posture in space. Um, unfortunately, most of us are not. Um, when we're doing that, that means as we're kind of learning this information, we tend to, to engage muscles, especially back here in our neck, um, which is really awful for us as far as how we actually are dealing with, um, you know, keeping our necks relaxed um, as we're playing. Um, for the kinesthetic, uh, this is a little bit more complicated, but when you're looking at that sense, it's actually just understanding how your body functions in space. It's like essentially that um, you're not looking down at your legs like right now, probably, um, and but you know where they are in space. And so that's kind of what that, you know, it deals with kind of motion and, and also um, tension um, and force. So Oh gosh, it's like, it's hard to do. I'm so used to doing this in well over an hour, but um, so now we're going to come back to how we get all of these things back. So that's just a general overview um, of what this is. So when we're thinking about how this relates to how we learn music, number one, um, what's so important when you think about, again, going back to that natural learning process. So that first thing is that you're going to have an accurate mental image. Um, and so how do we obtain that accurate mental image? It means that we have to be in a place where we're actually allowing that information to come in as easily as possible. Um, I think a lot of times we talk about anxiety, we could spend an hour talking about just that, but I think often we don't talk about anxiety enough as it relates to the learning process, the first part of the process. Um, when we are in an anxious state, um, that sensory information coming in is just, it, it's not as clear um, as it needs to be. Uh, as learners, the more relaxed we are and kind of open to that situation so that we can really focus in on what's important, um, it, the, the better off we are. So I think one thing I can say as a teacher that like we need to be aware of um, is that you're creating a space that allows people to feel really comfortable with failure, really comfortable with trying things out. It's the same thing as, as like, you know, if you... Um, are afraid to squeak all of the time, then you never actually learn what you need to learn so that you're, you're going through this whole process, the whole natural learning process, to figure out what information you actually need to do to do this correctly. Um, that fear prevents us from learning in the most efficient way possible, and that is at a core level for our body. Um, it's really an important concept to think about. Um, the other thing that I like to think about with this is 
you know, I'm always asking myself as a teacher, um, can you hear it? Can you feel it? Can you see it? You know, you, you need you need to use as many senses as possible to, to have the clearest mental image as possible and that we're giving people what they need at the front end of that process and also at the back end of the process. Um, so when you're kind of creating this really clear mental image, it's, it's just something like, you know, oftentimes I'll just use a very easy one. Um, is that we're saying, oh, well, you know, you really need to play with more upper lip, okay? Well, what does that mean? Um, and, and I think, you know, that's that question. So when you think, well, what, you know, how do, how do I know if I'm playing with more upper lip? Like, you know, so, so what you want to try to do is provide them with as much sensory information as possible. So if you just show them, I'm going to use my thumb for a moment as my, like, my mouthpiece. Um, so if I'm, you know, doing my normal embouchure, and so if I just showed them like this, uh, okay, so that's something, so they could see it, right? But then if you ask them to use their thumb, and not their mouthpiece, and hold the, you know, hold your thumb, and all of you can try this, uh, so you're going to feel your teeth on your thumb, but then, and you know, press down a little bit with your upper lip, so that you feel more of your upper lip than you do of your teeth. And so what then you're doing is not only can they see that, so if you do that, you know, or you press down, but they can feel it because they can feel it on their thumb, which gives them a lot more information than if they're just using their mouthpiece. So again, it, the more that you're engaging that sensory information right from the very beginning, the better off you are. Um, I do feel like, you know, uh, one of the other things that, that I think is very difficult for us as teachers, and I think we have to stay open and in the moment. Part of the reason I wanted to do this live is uh, I, I really feel like we have to be, this natural learning process is not just for your students, it's for us too. Um, we need to stay in the moment. We need to stay open. We need to 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 understand that we're going to go through the trial and error part, especially the error part. Um, and be fine with that and very accepting of it um, because then I feel like by being open and present in the moment that we're in then we have a, a, the opportunity to actually um, really teach we're not teaching a former student we're not teaching uh, you know something that we feel comfortable with we're teaching that student in the moment right then and, and I think that's so pivotal for us um, as teachers that we are doing that always um, so one is you know really utilizing that sensory information. Um, you know one of those things and in, in like with juggling that I like. I, I promise you if you want to have a little juggling clinic, I know I can see already we're not going to have time for this really, but um, I'm happy to do it. But I think you know it it if I were to juggle for you, just juggle. Um, and I said okay, here's your mental image right? And I just juggled. Well, that's not very helpful for you. Um, I'm sure that if I said, okay, so now you juggle for me. Um, and then the truth is, it's like after that, like, okay, well, you can't do that. So I would have to break it down into very um, clear steps with as much sensory information as possible. And that would start, I mean, like if I use just a tennis ball, that would start with just this, right? Just a one, one thing. Okay. Um, so that would be the same thing. Um, with clarinet, we have to do that as well. If the goals are too big, um, then we, we end up focusing a lot on the process and not the goal. And so that's, you know, we have to have small, identifiable goals that we can use sensory information for easily. Um, so uh, the other thing is that goes along with that is this whole verbal cognition thing. And when I was talking about with the babies, you know, imagine if your parents were telling you um, exactly, you know, what angles and um, ratios and everything you needed to, to walk, um, the, that would be much more, if you could actually understand what they were saying, that would complicate things so much more for you. Um, we have to be careful to say as little as possible. Um, that doesn't mean just sitting in silence. Um, if somebody is struggling, you have to come up with uh, brief descriptions um, that, that allow them to access sensory information and immediately give them an opportunity to go through this natural learning process. Uh, I think that that generally speaking when we're looking at a private lesson situation, um, the more that we can move directly to you say one thing, they get to try it out, 
um, go through the imitation trial and then and body feedback that they're very clear about the body feedback part you know and so that that other part is is you know again being in that environment where you feel like you can try something and that you're not afraid of that um, allows you to really access that sensory information on the back end as well and I think that's you know if you can't you know it'd be like if you're in a practice room and you 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 know I, I you couldn't see anything you couldn't hear anything well how do you know if you're doing this correctly um, you don't have enough information to do that um, so I think it's just the, that when we're, we're when we're thinking about anything that we're doing with teaching we need to make sure that they are leaving our office with a very clear mental image um, that they're able to go to the practice room with oh, I shouldn't say they all of us are um, that we can actually really make sure that we're learning in the most uh, efficient way for each of us um, and so this is like a, my very very cursory overview um, but I think if you think about especially that nervous system there's the you know the fact that if we um, aren't accessing that information clearly um, we are building these neural pathways um, that's how we end up with condition reflexes and that goes into um, a lot of other detail as well um, but I think you know it, this is the way our bodies work um, and it's important that we're teaching in a way that's really most efficient for our students. Um, so I will stop there to allow any questions um, or anything else that people would like to talk about or if you want a juggling demonstration I'll do it. I think that, I think that we need to have you do a presentation in person or a workshop in person where we get everybody at Clarinet Fest learning how to juggle. Well, <laughs> I think we, I, I would love that. And I mean, and actually, it's funny because I was thinking the one thing I haven't did my dog's asleep, but I, I, I haven't juggled for my dog uh, with my dog present, but I'm sure that would be actually, you know, <laughs> a little entertaining. But yeah, I, I should have said we could bring our juggling apparatus. <laughs> okay, the next world record that we set. I know that would be fantastic. <laughs> it would be fantastic. So, so I actually have a question and sure. this is just um, me thinking about um, special needs learners and yes. people who suffer from ADHD and other yes. um, disruptive disabilities that sort of block um, concentration efforts. How, as a teacher, how can we do a better job of recognizing that if a student has been di has not been diagnosed and they don't are not aware that they are suffering from that, are there some markers that can uh, help us guide them to? I mean, obviously, we're not clinical uh, trained people, so that's not something that we should be offering advice to. But I'm just wondering because I've had some students in the past that I suspect had suffered from ADHD and just couldn't focus during a lesson, and I wasn't sure if it was my teaching that was really sort of causing them to not be focused or if it was something that they were suffering through themselves. So I think that, you know, I, I think that one is, is that in our situation is that we're making sure that everybody is really, that our students feel like they're proactive learners with us, that we feel like, okay, um, you know, that we ask them a lot of like, you know, that we're of course responding to what we see that that's not happening on their side and try to adjust our methods for that. I feel like oftentimes, I mean, our whole world has, I, I mean, I, I could go on with this for a long time, but I mean, this makes me feel so old, but I mean, when I was, you know, up until the last year of college, there was no internet. So, you, you know, so when I was in a practice room and no cell phone. So, I mean, when I was in a practice room, I was in a practice room and you know, now I feel like we're getting all this kind of, we all have a little bit of attention deficit disorder, I think, to some degree. And you see, when, when we're trying to filter out that information, the sensory information, that's what, you know, we are, should not be multitasking in those ways. Um, and so I think for all of us, that means that maybe, you know, taking breaks often, in like maybe walking around the room, you know, sit, do a little bit of a, you know, set up and so that we're not just feeling like, okay, you've got to sit down and focus here on this, you know, all the way through. Um, I, I have a lot I could actually say, Jessica, on this, but I would say like little, I do little ga games sometimes, and it sounds kind of pejorative, I guess, but but it just, they're, they're fun, I promise, <laughs> for all these little things. But I think the main thing is, is to see, uh, you know, that the most inspiring thing for a student is that they get results right there. Right. If, if they can get results. And my my feeling is, is if if we're teaching in a way that we access that sensory information, 
right away. Um, and they're getting a lot of encouragement for us. And we make it, you know, just about this one thing and they're successful at it. It's so inspiring. And I think that that problem is, is that if we don't get that feedback, um, that then, then we get lost into this kind of loop, you know, um, that's my short answer. I see yeah. a comment here from Terrence looking for another example of the right and wrong way to present a, a specific concept. Okay. Um, so I, I would say this, um, uh, if I were, uh, if I were just saying, you know, to, to somebody, I'll, I'll use my, um, my embouchure comment again. Um, oh, I'll, oh, no, maybe I'll do it this way. So if I if I was trying to, to do voicing something with voicing, and I was just saying, okay, uh, you need to have your tongue high high in the back, um, low in the front, or you know you 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 need to to. I mean, here's a, here's one that would no one would say, but I'll just give it to you so you can see like how bad that would be. Like you know, basically your tongue needs to be two millimeters higher. Right. So nobody could do that. We don't know what that feels. I mean, that that's impossible for us to know. Right. So instead, we try to relate like one of those things when you think about the information processing is that the reason that with with fundamental concepts, we want to go from known to unknown. Like if I know how it feels to say E or U. Right, I can say you. I I've, I can do that already. And my brain kind of clicks in like, well, I already know what that is. So I'm I'm good with that, um, and I'm not thinking like oh, like all these little steps to do that. I'm just thinking you, and then we try it, right? Um, or relating like to, you want to again. You're just trying to engage. Like if I want to think of something like or like low pitch, or you can hear it in high pitch, things like that, and you actually give them little ways of locking in on that. That's what's going to make sense. And then, of course, if that doesn't work, and this is why we need to stay open as teachers, if it doesn't work, then you we've got to try something else um, right then and there. And, um, and not be afraid to be ridiculous and embarrass ourselves. Um, I think a lot of times we're trying to be so perfect and try to, you know, that we, we want to be all, but, like, you know, our students need to know that as a teacher, you are a learner and, you know, you're, you're teaching and learning. And as all teachers know, we learn more from our students than they ever learn from us. Um, they, they need to know that it's really great to, to be in the moment and make mistakes. And I mean, but that part of that trial and error, the reason I like juggling too is part of it when I'm teaching it in steps is you literally have to drop the ball. You know, you need to drop, in order to learn it the right way, you have to drop the ball. And we're afraid to do that. Um, and therefore, we we basically hinder ourselves from learning the ways that we need to. So. It's, it's really fantastic. I, I wish we had more time. Um, we do have a master class coming up. But um, if you have questions for Deborah, um, Deborah, do you want to provide your contact information? And they sure. Can um, I can. Let me let me put it here. This is you can find. I mean, nobody has, has my name. <laughs> so, oh, of course, when it, it auto corrected to dish, that's like, OK, it's D Bish. So that's. Um, and please feel free to send me an email. I'm sometimes slow answering email, but I want to hear from you and I will, I will answer it. It's the summer. It's the summer. It's the post pandemic. Well, uh, I, I was serious. Um, maybe we can set something up. I would love to, to go explore this more. And I think a hands-on presentation would be really effective in conveying this because I think you, you really hit the nail on the head on this because we really are afraid of putting ourselves out there as a teacher in a lot of ways sometimes. Yep. And I think, we just have to learn to let go and trial and error and all of those things. I mean, it's um, funny because I, I find it funny to me that nobody's expected to know how to juggle, but nobody else. But we still don't want to be bad at it. I'm like, you know, it's juggling. <laughs> but, you know, so anyway, but yeah, we could do it in mass. We could have maybe ICA, like little juggling net, like, you know. I'll look into it. Apparatus. Yeah, maybe we could have the, the little squishy balls. Yeah, that's yeah. Logo on. <laughs> so anyway, um, but I thank you. She oh, just sent it to the panelists here. 
I'll, I'll, I did. Here it is. One more time. All right. Well, we have a master class. There's also a recital happening right now. The Spotlight 8. You can get that on the uh, app, the, the guidebook app or the website. And this video, if you joined us late, will be up on YouTube uh, briefly. Maybe a couple hours before I can get to it because of all the back-to-back -back live sessions. But thank you so much, Deborah, for this thank awesome you. presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to exploring this content a little bit more myself. Yeah. Uh, and we will see you all again very soon. Thanks again. All right. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye.